I just say to whoever's running the audio, if I could just get a clip of Richard saying idiotic retard, that would be it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just had the same cell phone ring for so long. <laughs> idiotic retard. <laughs> found our backsides about two feet further away from Mecca and the tips of their nose. Now we know that in the world at least 7% of humanity have no time for religion. They are not born with it. I'm one of them. I'm sure there's lots of others here. But out in the countries such as Iran, how many of those people who have their nose to the ground and that vulgar demonstration of obeisance to Allah, we're thinking, oh no, here we go again. I hope that we could maybe help these people, and we do owe it to them. We're in, free, in the free West here, where we can say what we like. But there is a tradition of skepticism in the Middle East, in Persia, which is slowly but surely being choked. Now, the, we have Aaron Raw with us today, and his expositions on science, on reason, have had a tremendous effect in the English-speaking world. And I believe, I don't think I'm lying when I say that the people our side in the YouTube's war are actually on mopping up operations now. Reason has won that battle. But what my idea was, and maybe this is a mini pitch to Professor Dawkins, read the foundation, is that we can take these YouTube videos, which have been so useful to us, speaking English, and I know that they're translated into French and German and other languages, but could we start subtitling them, or maybe voiceovering in Persian, in Farsi, and sending them out on the YouTube again so that they can get a whole new audience and communicate our ideas to people who are ready to receive them, I'm quite sure. They are much safer now because there is the Tor system on, on, uh, on the internet where you can Google Tor and what they will do is they will give you an IP address that appears that if you're in Tehran that you're actually in Bern or Los Angeles or, or, or Dublin. So they won't be caught by the authorities. And I think we have a, an excellent opportunity here to, commute, to communicate our views to a, an audience that we really shouldn't neglect because they are our friends and colleagues. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that suggestion, and I will, I will certainly look into the possibility of doing that. It's the kind of thing that my foundation might very well love to do. Thank you. Brilliant idea. Uh, this is my first atheist event. I usually go to skeptics events when I see uh, Rebecca and Professor Dawkins. And at those events, a common question that, that we ask is, do we have to be skeptical? Is, is it appropriate to be a skeptic about everything, including religion, or can we leave that bit out? Because for pragmatic reasons, discussing homeopathy and all these other things, you, you, you don't want to offend people by bringing up religion. Obviously, that's not a concern here, where the atheism is the whole point. Um, but I was thinking about, does it work the other way? For instance, when you're talking to somebody and you're, oh, you're discussing their religion, should you leave the skepticism about other things aside, or can you say, your lucky rabbit's foot isn't helping either? <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah. I think the thrust of the question was that in the skeptics movement, the, the skeptical inquirer and so on, um, there's a kind of uh, taboo among at least certain members that you mustn't attack religion. And I, I met this when the skeptical inquirer movement, um, uh, what were they called, PSYCHOP, 
um, honoured me, gave, gave me some kind of an honour, and I, my acceptance speech was an attack on religion, and I was roundly castigated for this, um, um, possibly because it might have affected fundraising, I, I, I don't know what the reason might have been, um, but it seems to me to be a nonsense. Um, the the, def the defence offered is that religion is fine as long as it doesn't step on science's toes. Religion always steps on science's toes. Religion postulates miracles, uh, virgin birth, right, raising people from the dead, walking on water. Um, this is all anti-scientific and if you remove the miracles from, from religion, you've got nothing left that any uh, congregation would be, would be swayed by. So I don't see any need or reason to separate uh, scepticism about uh, whatever, you know, dowsing and telepathy and things from scepticism about gods. This is all scepticism and we all should be in the same boat. seem to get so offended by, but um, it's been my experience anyway from seeing other atheists argue or even from my own conversations. It doesn't take much to get labelled a militant atheist, like even <laughs> bringing it up at all. <laughs> so, so what would your idea of a weak atheist be? <laughs> I'm not talking about someone walking around with you know flowers in their ears or something like that, <laughs> um, you know, dancing or prancing or something of that nature. Uh, weak, in the sense of not not necessarily not strong, but not uh, strident, in the sense of the hard atheists, okay, uh, who are out there saying things to really push our movement. An example. Who's strident. I wasn't going to mention names. It's a lie. It's a lie. I, I, I'm standing back. Uh, no, uh, weak is, is just a you know, weak and strong type situation. It's, it's, such as in physics, neither is more powerful than the other. They work off of each other. Uh, in, that, in this example, perhaps, and I'll probably get some booze from this, Maybe Sam Harris is not as strong as Mr. Dawkins in his continued outwardness and outspokenness. So in that in that way, he might be more approachable. The Christian myth. No, no, no. You see, there's the you know, there you go. The Christian myth. So it's how they see who is strong as well. And who is, by their definition, might be weak. I think it's a here. I'm actually one of those who can sympathize with what Dan Barker said. Over and over again, people meet me and then they discover who I am and they say, But you're a very nice person. <laughs> they have bought the myth, as Tom has bought the myth. I'm not buying the myth, but I'm presenting the myth that the Christians believe. And so we must work on their perceptions of who they think we are. Uh, I often get the opposite response where people think I'm nice until they meet me. <laughs> If you want to go for a soft atheist, try a militant agnostic. I don't know, and you don't know either. <laughs> um, I'd like to get uh, the panel's uh, comments on um, on the various platforms of communication. So, not not what the message is, but like where, where you know where the message is. I mean, there's a good variety on the panel, right? We, we can go from you know, YouTube, blogs, TV, and books, right? So, uh, like, it seems like of all of them, it'd be the internet where, you know, it might be the toughest, you know, a lot you can, people can make shit up on the internet, a lot easier than the other platforms of communication. So maybe that's the toughest out of them all, 
and because you have to wade through all that crap to get your message out there, it's maybe not as it's maybe it's not the most effective platform. So uh, I, I mean, I, whichever the most effective and the toughest, you know. Thanks. I too am very enthusiastic about the internet as a medium, and I think it particularly might be important for reaching benighted areas of the world, uh, which are perhaps forbidden or unable to get hold of. Uh, books which can be read uh, in, in our part of the world. And so I think one of the great hopes of, of um, freeing the Islamic world from the yoke of Islam uh, might well be the internet. Um, the, the other possible hope there would be, as Johan Hari said, somehow to empower uh, women in Islamic lands, which he regards as, as the key. Um, turning to books, which I suppose is my role in this, in this panel of, of, of four, um, I think it's sort of similar to what Tom has just said, that, 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 that books, since they are um, published by publishers who have a reputation to uh, uphold, since they are reviewed in newspapers and, and magazines, um, there is a sort of quality control which there isn't in the internet. In the internet, we all, all have to be our own quality controller. We learn which particular websites we like, and we have to wade through an enormous amount of sheer rubbish before we can find it. Um, you can't get a book published by a reputable publisher if it's, if it's obvious rubbish. It has, to be, it has to go through a certain vetting process. Books do get examined and become a part of the culture generally if they're successful. Uh, they get reviewed, they become talked about, they become uh, a part of the currency of dinner party conversations in a way, um, as do television programs, by the way, um, in, a, in a way that internet um, websites only sometimes do. The, 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 the best known ones can achieve that as well. Okay, just one more question. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Um, staying on the topic of the internet, the YouTube user Thunderfoot has organized uh, uh, the John Mohammed Day for two years now, and I think this is uh, quite widely accepted and considered uh, a successful thing. But then he went a bit further with uh, this hard drive full of uh, copies of the Quran. I don't know if, if the panel is familiar with that. Um, he's basically stuffed a hard drive full of Qurans and then he's burned that hard drive with the, uh, with the idea that. Uh, these digital files are being deleted anyway as internet caches are being purged. So burning the hard drive physically is not going that much further. But this act seems to have polarized the online community quite a bit and he's taken quite a lot of heat for that. So I'm curious about what the panel thinks about that. Thank you. I think a, a parallel case is, is uh, PZ's uh, desecration of a communion wafer. Um, because that is... Um, that really is, is pure ridicule. I mean, that is saying, this is just a cracker. And um, you are, of course, hurting people's feelings, but they deserve to have their feelings hurt. Because, because it is just a cracker. It's their fantasy. And it's not book burn. Okay. But in the case of the satanic verses, there were some disgraceful examples of uh, intellectuals, certainly in Britain, I think of uh, Hugh Trevor Roper, the historian, and uh, various other people who actually uh, condemned Salman Rushdie and said that he deserved what he got uh, because he refused to take seriously what, what, as Michael Dummett, the philosopher said, refused to take seriously what other men find sacred. And that was a disgraceful betrayal by senior intellectuals in, in Britain of one of their number. Okay, thank you.